Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, welcome to The Tom Woods Show, episode 2474 with Brandon Harnish, who is a county councilman, Wells County, Indiana. I've known uh, Brandon in this crazy movement of ours for quite some time. In fact, I think, I don't know if I was going back looking in my email inbox or what it was, but I have some, or maybe it was even in Twitter, uh, in the messages, something like that. Somebody saying, hey, Brandon and I are going to be in town uh, at such and such time and it'd be nice to see you. And this was like 2010. <laughs> so Yes, this is an old I, friend, Emily. I Yes, that's I, right. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk about a bunch of things here. And given that Brandon is active in his local community. We're going to talk about localism and things that can be done on the local level. Everybody wants to run for president, you know, but sometimes at the local level, you know, the secret is you can get a lot more done than you think. And and maybe we focus a little bit more of our firepower there. Uh, let's start. I mean, Brandon's part of our movement, been around for, for forever and ever. And he's had a somewhat different path from other people. And uh, so he made his way out of the Libertarian Party and into the GOP. And a lot of the people I've had on this show have gone uh, in the opposite direction. So I, no matter which guest I have on, somebody will have steam coming out of his ears. But we're all civilized enough in the Tom Woods community to be able to talk to each other about strategic things like this. I mean, of all things to talk about, this one should be the most uh, peaceful and ironic. So uh, Brandon... Give us a little bit of that background, then I want to talk about what you're up to in your in your county. Well, sure, Tom. By uh, by way of introduction, um, the first time I uh, became familiar with you was, I, I believe it was the Christmas of 2004. My mother bought me a book for uh, for Christmas called the uh, Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, and I dipped into that book all the way back then. I would have been a high school senior, and then um, sometime later, I applied to attend um, this summer conference called Mises University. And uh, I started putting it together that, well, the same guy who wrote this book is actually going to be speaking at this university seminar. And so uh, that's when I started to really, I guess, um, make the connection. So I, I went to Mises University in 07, and then I returned in 08 and 09, um, the best week of the year, or the best week. Yeah, that's right. That's the best week of the year, for sure. Yeah, it's my favorite week. Yes. And then um, and then went uh, to the Rath. Uh, excuse me, the Rothbard Graduate Seminar in 2010. Um, and then from there, um, at that point, my college uh, career was was done. I had made the decision at that time that to not attend graduate school. I, I had considered it, um, went into family business, uh, and then really just um, went down a, a road very, very separate from, from politics, um, or at least anything you would consider maybe activism or, or, or politics uh, until um, 2020, 2021. And this seems to be something I, I, come, upon, I come upon often um, for a lot of people, 2020, 2021, those years uh, for so many have, le have left a scar on them. And um, whether it, it moved them from, it, it typically, it seems like it, move, it moved people, whether it moved them in the same direction that it moved me, which would have been from libertarian circle to Republican circles, or perhaps it moved them from Republican circles to libertarian circles. There's something about the year 2020 and everything we live through uh, that it just, uh, it was a force. Well, so, I was going to say, yeah. uh, uh, I was going to say that liber libertarians, small l, were in general better on what was going on in 2020 and 2021 than Republicans were. But Libertarians with a capital L weren't really so good, to put it mildly. Uh, it was embarrassing. It was watching the Libertarian Party Twitter feed in 2020 was, it was a, an exercise in, in two universes or something because they're, they're putting out tweets about the problems with civil asset forfeiture. And, and yeah, I, yes, I, remember, I remember this, right. Yeah. And I remember thinking, you know, they're right. You know, there's a lot of civil asset forfeiture abuse. We really should go yeah. after that. But but of all times now, I mean, <laughs> you know, it seems like there are a lot of other things going on and there's like no mention or you'd get a very grudging acknowledgement. All right, you shouldn't be 
forced to wear a mask, but unless you're a terrible person, you should wear it. I thought, what? What? I mean, like, you're you're even going to argue that these dumb things work, that every chart in the world is telling you they don't? So I can understand if you grew a little disillusioned uh, in those days, Brandon. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it was it was a confluence of factors. There there was, um, I, I remember it so well. I, I, the summer of 2020, as they call it, the summer of love, um, I remember the, the riots in Los Angeles. And I remember how our public health officials, after uh, locking everyone down for months on end, did an incre- such an incredible about face, right? So suddenly, racism is a public health crisis. And it's actually okay to be shoulder to shoulder in the streets marching. You can't go to church. You can't go to your family Christmas. You can't go to Easter. You can't go to school. You can't go to work. But the activist class they can march through the streets in protest. And I remember watching this on the news and I, it, was, it was almost a physical experience. My whatever left-wing sort of liberal sympath, classical liberal sympathies I may have had at that moment, um, they washed away or, or in, in a matter of hours. And Tom, I remember years ago, I, I, I would listen to your podcast and I always thought, well, he is sure hard on the left. You know, aren't these well-meaning people? Don't, don't they just want to maybe be like Jesus? Or wasn't, didn't Hayek have some kind of maybe sympathy for the left? They, they we're all seeking truth. How naive I was. How, I, I look back at that version of myself and I, I, I'm, in, I'm embarrassed. Well, you know, it's funny. I went a, a period of time where I didn't go after the left quite so much. I focused mostly on the neocons because I thought, well, everybody gets the threat of the left, which they did not. It, no. Uh, yeah. But these neocons insinuate themselves into seemingly conservative organizations and you've got to just smash these uh, neocons down. And then I emerged from having worked on, on that and I looked at the left again because I had kind of thought, well, some people on the left are starting to see the light on some important things, you know, but it was not that many. <laughs> you know, so I came up and I thought, oh my gosh, these people have been up to this all this time and I've not been paying attention. So uh, all kinds of different groups frustrate me that I think are figuring things out and then they're not. You know, like for a long time, I thought maybe some Republicans are starting to understand things because of the Tea Party and then mm-hmm. they would disappoint me with their boomer takes on important things. Or then I would think, well, maybe the left has figured out the problems with the military industrial complex or a surveillance state. And now it turns out, no, actually they're completely at peace with that. So it's a, it's a frustrating world, Brandon. It's frustrating. Yeah. And to be a Republican in the tradition of Pat Buchanan, Ron Paul, and Thomas Massey, you learn that disappointment is really a way of life at this, at this stage. Um, And that the way I've tried to make peace with the failures of my party is to recognize that we are carrying a torch. We are carrying a tradition. It may not be, we, we may not live to see a better, you know, a, a better world, if you will. We obviously we can't go back. Uh, um, but what we're doing is moving forward, carrying a tradition. And we're keeping that tradition alive. There, there are many ways for a society, for a culture to go wrong. But, I, and, I, and I think you've probably heard this, happy families all tend to be happy in the same way. And families that fall apart, fall apart in a variety of different ways. Um, I think this might, it may be some, some Catholic teaching on the family and on, and on, um, and on how, how to sort of pursue virtue, right? And, Maybe this is Aristotelian. I, I'm I'm not sure, but when I think about political order, I think about you know just social order, peace and prosperity. All of the countries that do it right do it right in the same way. We we can observe this. It, it's property rights. It's freedom. It's subsidiarity, and that's the tradition we try uh, with the, the torch we carry. And so um, when I'm engaged in conversation with my sort of fellow Republicans locally or on the state level, I, um, 
I'm just trying to keep the tradition of Buchanan, Paul, and Massey alive. Or to go back further, it would be Lewis and Tolkien and Kirk, this sort of old conservative tradition that we can't let fade into memory. And so it, because the failures occur so often and because the disappointments are all around us, um, that, that's where I've tried to plant my flag so that I don't lose my mind, so that I'm not overcome with despair. Yeah, yeah. See, my strategy would be to, uh, and, and indeed has been when talking to people, let's say, who are in the GOP, uh, is to use arguments and language that they know in their hearts ought to resonate with them, even if it's not what the party leadership is calling for. Uh, so in, in 2012, the, you know, the, the Ron Paul people completely took over the Iowa Republican Party, completely took the whole thing over. And they invited me to come up and give a lecture series to just ordinary folks in Iowa. And I gladly accepted. I mean, yes. why would I not do that? And so I went up there and I, I gave them some, uh, a little bit of intellectual backing for some of the ideas that they already more or less held. And then as if you know, not missing a beat, I gave them a whole lecture on the, the urgency of non-intervention abroad. Which, and, 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 I, and it was none of this, well, no, I know this might not be what you're expecting to hear. And I, I gave it as if it was the most natural thing in the world. And that was what worked, was what worked because I had built up some capital with them by, you know, telling them how I felt about Obama and all that and, you know, all that stuff and giving them a little thing on economics and they appreciated that. But then I just, right into the stuff that they weren't expecting to hear, but arguing it not from a non-leftist perspective. And I'm, you know, and look, I mean, I, right. I dressed like this. At that time, I drove a minivan still. My kids weren't grown. And, you know, I was about as bourgeois and mainstream as I could possibly be, uh, reasonably, you know, well put together. And that was able to get them to at least listen, because at least we have some common vocabulary. I feel like, at least for me, I haven't got that vocabulary with the left. Now, I know people who have reached people on the left because that's where they themselves came from. And so they could use that common vocabulary to talk together. I, you know, I can't do everything. I, I can just, I can speak to people who are standing where I once was, you know, which was, uh, you know, they're standing where I used to be, which was when I first entered college, I was like a Mitt Romney guy. That really was where I was. So I know the way those people think because that was my old brain. Yes, I, and this is, this is something that I've come to appreciate on the local level where you're dealing with flesh and blood people on a regular basis is, you know, particularly as a Republican under the age of 40, there is a generational divide. Um, and perhaps this is a small white pill for your audience that the younger Republicans do have a a real sense of frustration with the older generation of Republicans in how much we have lost. We look around our culture, we look around our institutions, and we ask the very simple question, we're the conservative party, but what have we conserved? When, all of, when the, the entire national security apparatus is promoting sodomy, when they're, when they're promoting LGBTQ politics, when you have the really everything for with with the exception perhaps of the libertarian party everything every institution in our culture has been captured and there is a more aggressive uh sentiment among younger republicans but we do have to we come from a tradition we we cannot alienate particularly on the local level um, you don't want to walk into a party and pretend that you're the smartest one in the room, that you've got it all figured out. You're the newcomer, but you have all the answers. I've, um, and, and some of this is learning from experience and learning from my own mistakes, but I can tell you that that, being able to use a common vocabulary, like you said, is absolutely critical. And being able to speak as, in my case, as a Hoosier, to, to appeal to a, a sort of inherited common sense or an inherited um, understanding of our of where we come from. What are our cultural values? What do we believe in as a people, as a community? And this is, this is a very different way of thinking than 
perhaps my past self um, when I was much more libertarian, much more individualist. Um, the idea of inherited common sense, of shared values, were perhaps I didn't reject them outright, but I didn't embrace them wholly because I didn't perhaps quite understand what it looked like to be a radically individualist society. And Tom, I can tell you, um, I didn't, it, it wasn't until the rise of transgender, transgender politics that I was, I looked at this and I thought, oh, this is what radical individualism means in, in the worst sense. Um, the, the word individualism has a lot of different meanings and connotations historically, but you could see how um, if my, my social connections do not define me, I will define myself. So if my parents have given me a name, I can change that name. If my social structure in which, or my, so, my social context has given me a, a gender, I can in my own individual capacity choose to change that gender. I have no limitations to my choice. I have no social context that would hamper my decision-making, uh, my freedom. And it was this realization for me, um, speaking in sort of my own, to some extent, my own ignorance that um, gave me maybe a deeper appreciation for the conservative tradition to say, you know what, maybe having shared values really is very important. Maybe coming from a healthy community um, where, you know, we don't have to rely on purely homeschooling our children, that maybe maybe it would be great if we could actually trust um, our public schools with our children. That, that I think, is something that, in, that pushed me in the direction of a more conservative Republican approach to politics as opposed to libertarian. And I, I'm not meaning to, to sort of build up a straw man or anything, um, but again, to sort of come back to what your point was about speaking that common language of a place where they're coming from, it's critical. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. And of course, you know, I've been talking a lot about monetary metals, which is a service for people smart enough to know they need to own some gold, but who also are ambitious enough to want to see that gold grow. And with monetary metals, you can earn interest on your gold paid in gold. And we have here a monetary metals client. David, why monetary metals? What value does it bring you? Well, Tom, I started investing in gold probably about seven or eight years ago. And I was listening to your podcast. You had mentioned monetary metals. And I ran the numbers and I realized that the earnings or gains I could have had on that gold, not just in terms of earning more gold, but even looking at just the dollar value was half of what it could have been. So by being able to earn that interest in gold on gold has allowed me to start maximizing my returns long-term while also having the benefit of the safety net of earning gold, especially in such a high inflationary environment. Well, David, that is exactly how I myself feel, which is why I also have an account at Monetary Metals. So find out more at monetary-metals.com slash woods. That's monetary-metals.com slash woods. I want you to talk about actually getting elected to whatever the, the county council. I don't know anything about how that works or what authority they have. Or sure, sure. How you won, for example. How did you win? What, what, did you run on a particular issue or did you run on, hey, I'm a guy who's lived here a while and you can trust me? Like, How does that even work? Well, yeah. So um, there, there are, you know, in local politics, having the right last name is a big deal. And um, my family has lived in this county um, since before the Civil War. And uh, we've um, long established lineage in the county. My, um, my cousin played football here locally. He was drafted in 2012 to the Indianapolis Colts. Um, he was the last pick in the draft. So he received the, um, the distinction of Mr. Irrelevant, uh, being, I think, maybe the 253rd pick of the draft, something like this. Um, so there was some notoriety there. Um, he was a successful football player. Um, but then, you know, I'm a fourth generation business owner in my city. Um, my, another cousin of mine owns a, a funeral home here. So again, having those community roots is important. Um, stepping into the Republican party, um, and rec just kind of recognizing that this, this is a group of people for whom 
you really do agree on most issues. Um, obviously, Ron Paul made himself at home in the party. It, you know, sure, he, he was certainly on an island at times, um, but this is still his party. And you can join the Republican Party as a Pat Buchanan Republican or as a Ron Paul Republican or as a Thomas Massey Republican. And, um, and I reference these people in my campaign. Uh, and you can really pick, you can get some traction with that. Now, I, I've come to find that Pat Buchanan may be a little more obscure for the, the general voting public. But when you're talking to your fellow Republicans, particularly the, those in the baby boomer generation, they're going to remember Pat Buchanan. And they're going to appreciate the fact that a young under 40 Republican is, knows who Pat Buchanan is, let alone has read his works and appreciates him. Um, so running for office, the, the first thing I did um, was wait my turn, if you will. Um, I made the decision when I joined the party that I was going to wait to be asked. And it wasn't very long um, that after attending the local breakfast, after plugging myself into the local Republican community, um, that I was, I was asked to run against a Democrat incumbent. I filed. Uh, I started raising money immediately. And the pitch um, at that point was, um, we want to raise as much money as possible to intimidate the Democrat from running, from filing. Uh, it's a very, very Republican district. Um, he did have the, I, I'm, I'm in the most Democrat seat, if you will, uh, the, the most purple district. Um, he had... Uh, eight years on the, on the council. But when I filed, when my name was made public, um, raising money, he decided not to run again. And so I was, uh, at that point, the Democrat seat had opened up. I did not have a primary opponent. Uh, the party really got behind me. Then, um, then the pitch became for fundraising purposes, hey, the Democrats have until July to put somebody into this seat to, to run against me. Um, and so we wanted again to intimidate anyone from, you know, from running for that position. And we, we had a great fundraising performance and I was able to avoid a competitor in the primary and a competitor in the general election. Um, and I, I do owe that partly to the, to the fundraising performance because that is public, public information. And, uh, so that, that's the, that was the path. For getting elected. So just, just to sum it up, just to be clear, I joined the party. I did not join as an enemy. I made a lot of friends in the party. I did not use every disagreement as an opportunity to, um, to start an argument. Uh, joined the party, got some support. Um, there were some who did not particularly care for old Harnish, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we, we were able to navigate that and, um, and here I am now, uh, I'm four months into my second year in my first term, not without controversy. We've, um, we've certainly had our successes. And uh, one thing I am particularly proud of is we successfully worked with our local library uh, board to uh, leave the American Library Association. We were uh, happy about that. The library board is, um, you know, this, this actually reminds me there's there's something that is important to talk about it's, it's the administrative state on the local level but i'll, I'll hit pause there I'll, I'll turn it back over to you if you had anything to ask well i i did i want to know okay now that you're in what are some things that this body can do that that uh, you've been involved in sure so um the in indiana the way county government is organized um is distinct from city government so let me just give an example. Um, in city government, you have a mayor and you have a city council. The mayor is the chief executive. He really runs the whole show. He makes hiring and firing decisions. Um, there are, um, perhaps there's a clerk treasurer in the city who is elected, but other than the clerk treasurer and other than the city council itself, there are no other elected positions. The mayor is really the guy at the helm. Um, he hires the police. He hires utilities. He hires city managers. He really runs the whole show. County government's very different. County government, um, you have a board of commissioners. That's your executive position. Those are your three executives, uh, at least in a, 
county our size, we have three of them. So it's not even a unitary executive. You have three uh, commissioners. Then you have a county council. We set the budget. In other words, the, the council kind of functions like a clock. It, it, you set the clock and then it runs the whole year. So, for example, during budget time, we had a line item in the budget. Budget time is when the county council, it's the fiscal body of the county or what you might call the legislative body, but the commissioners have some legislative authority as well. So we, uh, during budget times when the action happens and there was this silly line item in our emergency management um, department, emergency management department, um, it was a line item that said PPE. And I just did a couple of informal questions to some friends. I said, hey guys, when you hear PPE, what do you think of? They're like, oh, masks, COVID. I said, that's what I figured. So we just made a symbolic gesture, not to zero the line item out, but to completely nuke the word PPE from the budget. Just, we're not going back there. This is purely symbolic. It has no effect on the county whatsoever. If they need to buy boots or other equipment, they can use another line item to do it but I don't even want to see the word PPE in our budget. And the, the best part is you just make a motion. Say, I make a motion to nuke this. Do I hear a second? Somebody has to second that motion. The Roberts Rules of Order is something that you actually learn is extremely important. And um, you can use it to your, to your advantage. So one way you do this is you just make motions that you know the Republican base is really going to love. And you sort of force your colleagues to either you know, to vote against it, really. I mean, if you can get that second, then you can put people on the record to vote. Right, yeah, which is and where they don't colleague- want to be, but where you need to put them. You know, it, I think any, anybody who, who has a well-formed worldview, so whether it's somebody like you, or let's say even somebody who is an elected libertarian, capital L, I would tend to guess that those people, even though they, they don't, won't necessarily get everything passed that they want, uh, nevertheless, can make an outsized impact, at least in terms of publicly getting I- issues discussed. Because I would guess a lot of people who run for office on the local level uh, are just ordinary people who have no ambitions beyond that. They just want to make their town better or you know, anything kind of harmless like that. So when you have a firebrand who has really thought things through and intends to make a statement, I, I, I mean, am I right that somebody like that is going to tend to be more active, um, um, introducing more resolutions or whatever than, or motions than, um, you know, again, average Joe who just wants to clean well, up his town or something? Tom, so I'm glad, I'm glad you asked about this because yes, the, the answer to that is, is an emphatic yes, but where this really matters the most is not necessarily some isolated line item in a budget or it's not a resolution that, you know, we're a pro-life community or a resolution that we support the Second Amendment. It's the people you put on unelected, unelected, excuse me, administrative boards. So your health board, for example, if, um, you you know, if if you had had local officials with a well-developed worldview um, an extreme concern for property rights, an extreme concern for um, just sort of traditional liberties, you would have had a much, how do, I, how do I describe this? You would not have just put people on the health board because they attended church with your wife or, well, they're always at the potluck or they meet some on-paper credential, right? You want fighters on those health boards who have the right convictions. Um, you want people with that local common sense. You're not always going to, fi- you know, you, you all, you're only as good as your bench. So you're not always going to find a Rothbardian fighter. But what you can find are the people that Pat Buchanan called conservatives of the heart. The, the people who, they may not have ever read Russell Kirk or Edmund Burke, but they know in their hearts the American way of life. And they know that mask mandates are inappropriate for a free society. How do they know this? They just do. They have an inherited sense. So that's where guys like, you know, 
that's that's where your libertarian Republican on the local level, or even even um, Kane, Glenn Jacobs, and now he's a he's a, a sort of a rare treat because he has this Misesian Rothbardian tradition that he's a part of, but you he has to find you know average people that he's going to put on these administrative boards that he's going to hire for his city, and that's where it is so critical to understand that ju- just just having a college degree or just having all the right credentials on paper maybe isn't the biggest issue. Maybe you really have to sit down with people who are applying for your administrative boards and have a conversation with them. Make sure that they share your values. And, and that really is where, uh, you know, a firebrand, if you will, somebody with that well-developed political, um, political worldview and moral worldview can make a big difference. And you go seek those people out. Far too often, um, you'll you'll have an application for a board, especially on the local level, Tom, where you never meet, you know, your local elected officials never meet the people that they put on boards. They just see an application. And everybody just raises their hand and the the person's put on the board and well, that, you know, they graduated with this degree or that degree and uh, they look like a responsible member of the expert class. So I guess we'll put them on this administrative board. Well, those are the boards that decide, you know, whether or not you're locked in your home, whether or not you can go to mass, whether or not um, your library is going to promote inappropriate material to children. You know, this is a part of my biggest frustration is what you learn is on county council, you really don't have much authority at all. You have some limited appointment authority, but so much of what I've been able to do, what I've tried to do is use informal power. You, you have to stick your nose in other people's business. You have to get your hands dirty. You can't just fight every battle at the po- with the power of the purse, especially on the local level. I mean, look, if you want to defund you know, research on lizards in New Guinea, in Washington, D.C., that's fine. You can do that. How do you fight battles on the local level with the power of the purse? That's very, very difficult to do. Have you found any allies? Oh, uh, yes. The, or, yes. Or have you yeah. created allies? Have you yes. educated yeah. even your own colleagues, maybe? Yeah, you, you know, education is always difficult. Um, I'm, I'm not the most gifted apologist for libertarian ideas. I'm not the most gifted speaker. I'm a very... You probably know I'm a very disorganized speaker, a disorganized thinker at times, maybe get lost in the abstract a little bit. But what I think the most important thing you can do is you find those points of commonality. You know, when you're working with local Republicans trying to solve problems and they can see problems, but they may not have the solution. Maybe you can come in with a libertarian perspective and say, hey, I think, for example, Tom, um, the the out of control administrative state. This is this is a theme with Republicans right now. It's a theme with Libertarians. One thing we have seen on the local level, and not just in my county, but in Indiana generally, are how economic development plans can sort of unfold. So you you know, the mayor puts together an economic development plan, or the county puts together an economic development plan. But these plans are built by the professional class. They're built by experts. They're not necessarily built by your elected officials. So you could have an entirely libertarian county council and county commission, but if they're outsourcing all of their day-to-day work to chambers of commerce or to economic development professionals, and maybe those chambers, maybe those professionals are overseen by an appointed board and the board is full of hospital administrators and librarians and teachers and school superintendents. Are you going to wind up with a local government plan with a, with a local government that actually reflects the, the political leanings of your libertarian council and commissioner? No, you're not. You're going to end up with a administrative regime that is completely disconnected from the political values of the voters and then by extension of the county council and the county commissioners. So this is one thing I've been pushing is um, to to stop outsourcing so much work. We need to have direct oversight over economic development. We need to have direct oversight over advertising so that you don't wind up with some 
left wing radical or left wing white collar administrator in a power in a position of power and influence driving an agenda that is disconnected from the voting public. I'm an I live in an 80% red county. That is no protection against leftism if you're not controlling your boards, if you're not controlling the administrative apparatus. So how do you do that? Well, okay, so you have a phone call, right? You say, hey, council president or commissioner president, or you talk to your uh, Republican Party uh, leadership, and you emphasize the importance of putting conservatives on elected boards, or excuse me, on non-elected boards, on appointed boards, and it's effective. We're, we're, we reach out to members of the party and say, hey, look, you know, there's ac- across the whole county, there's maybe only 20 elected positions. Um, where, where people who want to be engaged in the party and involved in the party, um, maybe, you know, especially in a, a county like mine, every, every, every elected office is held by a Republican, but we have 70 some people show up to our county breakfasts. Well, what are the other people doing if they're not elected? Well, we can appoint them to boards. We can put you on the library board. We can put you on the health board. We can put you on you know, really just any, any board at all, the, the local property tax appeals board. We, we, so in the state of Indiana, you have a, a rule that um, your appointed boards have to be bipartisan. So we grab, we use the Libertarian Party here locally to build out uh, really a bench for appointing Libertarians to the board so we don't have to put Democrats on boards. So our local property tax assessment board of appeals, we have a libertarian on there, card carrying member of the Libertarian Party, reached out to him, and um, he understands that he's not just a rubber stamp for the tax assessor. Yeah, and that, I, that's one way we've been able to use um, really just control the boards, keep elected officials in line, keep un, um, unelected administrators in line. It's critical. Hey, everybody, quick word from Woods here. It's my goal to have the best supporters program out there, better than anything on Patreon or anywhere else. Support the Tom Woods Show, and not only do you get entry into my no-censorship Tom Woods Show elite group, but you also get the 16-page Tom Woods elite letter mailed to your home every month. Who else is doing that? This is all new material, completely different from the emails I send, and it is red hot. My supporters also get invites to my murder mystery dinner parties that I've been holding around the country. I'll be adding more cities soon to woodsmystery.com. I hold these in penthouse suites at luxury hotels with a beautiful catered dinner. It's a ton of fun. I also invite my supporters to my annual Christmas party. And the higher up you go as a supporter, the more things you get. Some supporters even get a small gift in the mail from me every month in addition to the newsletter. So go check it out, supportinglisteners.com. You will not believe all the goodies at supportinglisteners.com. And my profound thanks to all of you. You know, one of the hardest pieces of advice to take or or to, to deal with, to absorb, is the serenity prayer attributed to Reinhold Niebuhr. And if if he really did come up with it, it's the best thing he he ever did. He was not my favorite guy otherwise, but 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 for anybody who doesn't know. It's something along the line, like it has to do with, uh, give, is it give me the serenity to, to, or, or the, what, what, what is the, well, hold on a minute. I'm going to get it. <laughs> hold on. Yeah, I may have a card here with it. I've, I've got it. I, I've got it. Grant me, the, not, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The reason that's, that's a right, hard that's right. thing to accept is that so often we want to, we want to think that we can, we can change the things that we can't change. You know, we're, we're just going to force certain things into that category, whether it's realistic or not. And it's very, very hard for us to say issue A and issue B belong in the, the category of things I cannot change. It, it, sometimes it takes a long time to settle on that. And so I, I raise this in the context of what you're doing because – you know, you are in a position of some kind of political power, but at the same time, you have to, you, you realize that you have to modify your ambitions. You have to, you have to accept that there are some things you can accomplish and some things you can't. 
So given that there are other people around the country in exactly your position who are doing their best to try to hold off the worst of what they want to do to us, how would you advise people in terms of categorizing things you cannot change, but the things, also the things you can and, and, and how to, how to make the most out of those things that you can? Yeah, um, I suppose I, I am still working on that very problem myself, Tom. Um, and you should I write recognize- a guide for other people, you know, for people in state house or whatever in, in all over the country. I, I, but, but, I love giving people assignments. You don't actually have to. Yeah, do yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the professor is never, never quite, never quite retired. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have uh, I have good friends in the state house in Indiana. The the general assembly is a hundred people, and I have had people ask me, "Would you ever run for state representative?" Um, I can I I struggle enough being one of seven on a county council. I can't imagine being one of a hundred, and uh, it is a um, it's a it's a very very challenging personal problem to see all of these issues that you can't, especially coming from a small business background, where if there's a problem, I'm going to solve it. I, I run my own website. I, I run my own business. I run my own advertising. When I see a typo, I just log in and change it. I, I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. I, you can just immediately correct problems and solve problems. And I remember growing up, my father, local business owner, people would ask him, would you ever run for mayor? And he would give this answer that at the time I didn't quite appreciate. He said, I can't imagine working with other people. He, he was, you know, the buck stopped with him. He was the, the sole business, sole proprietor, business owner. He ran the show. When there was a problem that needed to be fixed, he would fix it. It does not work that way in local government. And I, under, I recognize that it is partly by design the, the system is almost built to fail. Uh, it's, it's also, in some sense, built to avoid too much power consolidating into one man. Um, but I guess, it, I guess here's, what, here's what I think in terms of uh, state house. If I ever got elected to the state house, I would use it as a way to transmit my ideas. I would, I would use it the way Eric Brakey used his position in Maine where he would get up there and like they would have some kind of feckless resolution about how they support Ukraine or some kind of thing in their, in their state house. And they would expect everybody as just a formality to go ahead and vote for that. And then Eric would right. stand up and he'd have this 10 page diatribe about U S foreign yes. policy. That would be me. I would do that. Yes. It's true that I would have to deal with a whole bunch of dopes, but I would get outsized attention. For, I would not, if there were a hundred people in that state house, I would not be getting just 1% of the attention. <laughs> so that's I, what I want you I, to do, you know, get it, yeah, be yeah. the guy, no, you know? Well, you know, it's, it's a, the, the fact that I use a Twitter plat, platform at all, and I have, I have certainly attracted some, some very venomous people with that platform. Um, but the fact that I use that platform at all, I, I am by far the most outspoken local Republican. And even at that, I, I, I try to, I, I, you, you do have to remember the, the political culture out of which you sort of, which you, that you serve in and out of which you come, if you will. So if you don't have a, especially in a small community, if you don't have, there, there are just some natural confines, if you will. So, Tom, this, this is actually an interesting problem, right? Because what, what Brakey is doing and what a lot of very, very good Republicans are doing around the country, you, you see this with Thomas Massey. Uh, Thomas Massey in 2020 standing up and demanding a roll call vote on the CARES Act. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I will take a man with courage over a man with the right ideas 10 times out of 10. Yeah, yeah. I know he had the stone and, and all those, it, it, all those people who should have supported him, you know, who, who made whatever dumb Trumpian argument against him, like Trump's going to be against that. 
Like, what's the matter with I mean, you people? The, well, and here, Tom, there were there were his his allies were were begging him not to commit political suicide. So it's not just a sense of cowardice, but there's this rational calculation that hey, don't die on this hill, live to fight another day, and you're always trying to strike a balance between being foolhardy and being a coward in politics. And Thomas Massey, the more you demonstrate courage the way Thomas did, the easier it becomes over time. He will never, ever find himself in a position where he is on an island like he was in 2020 ever again. I, I, I find that unlikely. Every single instance of courage that man is going to be required to demonstrate for the rest of his political career will be less than what he showed in 2020. It's got to be smooth sailing yeah. for this guy. Yeah. We, we, and I'll say it again. I will take, if you give me the perfect libertarian, but he is unwilling to second motions, he is unwilling to make motions, useless. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. You know what, what? What astonished me about the way some of the Trump people dealt with Massey? First of all, he's he's better than Trump in every way. Every way, absolutely. And 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 and, un, and but yet he's not like anti-Trump to the point where he won't stand up for uh, against an injustice. Because like, he he demolished the RussiaGate narrative. I mean, he he doesn't buy in any of the craziness either. But he's got principles to the point where he's willing to be, as he has shown repeatedly, he's willing to be in a very tiny minority, knowing full well that he's going to take abuse from the left, from the Trump people and all that. But he's just got to do it. What has astonished me is how few Trump people seem to be capable. And it's not just Trump people. I should be fair. But how few people are capable of uttering the words, you know, I don't agree with him on this position, but doggone it, we sure need more people who have guts and aren't just part of the machine. Couldn't you, like, why is it so hard to say those words? It, it's, it's a culture. It's a culture in the party. And it's, it's, it's very, very heavy. There is, in there is a tremendous pressure. I'm sure Eric Brakey could talk to you about this, and he would know it better than I would being in, um, in a higher office. There is a tremendous pressure in the Republican Party as a whole, and there are mechanisms they can use to enforce this to be quiet. Yeah. To be quiet, just shut your mouth, go along to get along, don't rock the boat. And I, Indiana has a uniquely powerful, um, it's, it's, look, Indiana is a very conservative state. I think our Indiana Republican Party does a lot of good work. Um, but there are, there are mechanisms in place to make sure that, for example, let me just give you one example. Um, the state of Indiana recently passed, the, the governor vetoed it, but it was an anti-Semitism bill that applied to speech on college campuses. It was pretty well defanged. This bill passed 100, I believe it was something between both the House and the Senate, it was something like 100, there was one dissenting vote. I know that there were more than one, mem there was more than one member of the combined General Assembly that opposed that bill. They voted for it. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they got the memo. Hey, if you want support from the House Republican Campaign Committee bank account, if you want the Treasury to help you in your primary reelection, you're going to vote this. You're going to vote for this. Not only are you going to vote for it, but if you're on committee, you're not going to amend it and you're going to send it through. And everybody fell in line. Yeah. It, it is, the, the, the pressure is tremendous. And it's, it's and Brakey has called Washington, D.C. a well-fortified citadel of corruption. I think that's the line he's used. That is, that is true of, that's just the nature of politics. And at least in our country, the, I, I, and again, I'll come back to it. The virtue of courage it is so hard to find because so often courage looks like you're just being an idiot. Yeah. I mean, put, your, put yourself in the shoes of Thomas Massey back in 2020. He's not going to stop this thing. This is a freight train coming. But he's going to go there and he's going to demonstrate uncommon courage. 
And you know what? If Thomas Massey had asked me, should I drive to Washington, D.C. and demand a roll call vote on this or should I live to fight another day? Tom, frankly, I would have probably told Thomas Massey, hey, let's be calculating about this. Let's think this through. Are you going to be able to stop it? No. Well, maybe, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. Well, you know what? Credit to Thomas Massey for, for ignoring the theoretical harness advice and, and, and doing it anyways because it demonstrates to guys like me, hey, you know what? Maybe being, maybe being courageous it's not always obvious. Maybe, maybe sometimes it does feel like being a fool. Sometimes it does look like being foolhardy, but you do it anyways. And that's, that's the other thing I want to mention to, um, to your audience, that courage is contagious. If you, the more people, whom, the more Rothbardian libertarians, the more paleo-libertarians, the more massy libertarian types, the Ron Paul guys who move to the Republican Party, they, they change the culture in the party. They make it easier to show courage. It is hard to be on an island for a variety of reasons. And all of those reasons always look very rational, very reasonable. Yeah, I, 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 again, I, I hear you. And I, I'm thankful also that you're talking about Massey ignoring your you know, theoretical advice, uh, hypothetical advice. Um, Ron Paul ignored my advice, which I didn't give to him personally, thank goodness. I just wrote it in a blog post. At, at yeah. the beginning of, of his first presidential campaign as a GOP candidate, I said, you know, all this talk about the Fed is just too technical for the average person. You know, you probably should just not, not do that. <laughs> and that turned out to be like the central theme of his whole thing. You, and so I thought, right, right. And I thought you know, I, I can appreciate, I, I need some, some, um, uh, humility once in a while. And, and I, and I was very, very happy to concede, uh, that point, but yet that was surprising. I mean, I will give myself that, that, that it was very hard to predict that that was going to catch fire. Uh, and I mean, certainly no consultant, although the consultants are all useless and overpaid, but certainly no consultant would have told him to do that. So I'm glad, That's right. you know, he doesn't listen to any consultants. He just listens to himself. So do you have, um, so you are on Twitter. What's your what's your Twitter handle? Paleo GOP. Paleo GOP. Wow, that's a incredible. That was available. Uh, and um, so, is that the best place for people to follow what you're up to, or do you have some other? Yeah, I, I also have a campaign page on Facebook. That you know, being that it's Facebook, it just doesn't get as much attention or action. But you can find me. Um, I I think it's Brandon Harnish for Wells County. Okay. Okay. All right. Anyway. Uh, any parting words before we go? I want to make sure you feel like you had your say. Well, sure, sure. Um, you know, there, there's there's so much that could be said, but I, I'll I'll reiterate that um, you know the reason I started my Twitter account so so many years ago now, and it's been banned a couple of times and, and brought back to life, but was to encourage those members of the Libertarian Party who, for one reason or another, are frustrated with where they are, to to get involved in their local. Republican Party. Go to the breakfast, make new friends, meet people, make connections. You're, it's so critical. And look, if the Republican Party was perfect, we wouldn't be necessary. I, I hear people tell me, well, look what they did to Ron Paul, or I don't want to be a part of the party of George Bush and John McCain and Dick Cheney. Right. I don't want the Republican Party to be that way. That's why I'm in it. You know, if we just point out the historic flaws of this party, I, it's never going to get better. If we, if we all just, in, in, out of a justified sense of, of frustration, if we take our hands off of it and say, well, it's not good enough, I'll join it when it gets better, it's never going to get better. The burden is on us. No one is coming to save us. We, we really do have to get plugged in to the Republican Party, win or lose, right? We're carrying a tradition forward. And, and, I, and I'll kind of leave you with that, that, you know, I can't promise that you're going to win. I can't promise that we're going to win in the short run. Um, I do have some religious conviction that we'll win in the long run. But in the short run, I don't know what's going to happen. But what I do know is that we're keeping the tradition of Western civilization alive. And that's, that's what we have to do. We have to carry the torch. Well, Brandon, um, continued good luck to you. Um, whatever works, I favor. 
And if what you're doing is working, then I favor it. Now, that sounds a little bit too utilitarian, but I mean, you know, within reason, right? <laughs> within certain moral boundaries, I, I support right. that. So um, I'm, I think this is the first time I've ever had you on. So it took me a long time, but I'm glad we did it. And uh, keep you posted on how things are going. Well, thanks a lot, Tom. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.